Hi students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria here on the west coast of Canada. I hope everybody has had a lovely week and is looking forward to a fantastic weekend. Welcome Aryan, Jasandeep, Sukmani, Viji, Shivankar, good to see many students in this class. We are looking at the IELTS uh, listening uh, section. And uh, we are particularly looking at uh, part three and part four of the listening, the more challenging parts. And we're going to be focusing on getting all the answers correct, getting that band nine. While we wait for a few more of your peers, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Check us out there for the general IELTS. Visit us at g-i-e-l-t-s-help.com. That's generalieltshelp.com. On both of our websites, we have lots of lots of uh, materials practice exams, lesson videos, interactive courses, apps for your phone to help you get those high band scores. In fact, we'll be using our aehelp.com website today for our listening. Um, all you need to do to get our premium package is click that big red button. It's a one-time payment, lifetime access. Doesn't cost very much, especially when you compare it to the IELTS exam, um, and it will definitely help you to improve your scores. We help thousands of students every day we are an official British Council IELTS Test Registration Center and certified agents, so you're in great hands with us. Um, and for the general IELTS, it's the green background. You have to click that big red button there to join our premium package. Welcome, Rashika. Hi, Paulo. Good to see our members joining in on the class. Everybody this Sunday at this exact time, um, we will be airing my IELTS Band 9 Journey Episode 4, uh, which will be my IELTS test results. I took the official IELTS exam. Uh, we filmed it. We made a short series, uh, registration, preparation, test day uh, results. And I will be sharing my results with you and giving uh, some feedback on that this Sunday. All right. Uh, if you have questions, send me an email. Adrian at aehelp.com, uh, questions about IELTS, questions about our products, we're happy to respond. And uh, tomorrow we'll have a couple more classes for you, members, we'll have a Q&A session, okay, and then we'll have a speaking part two cue card uh, practice for everyone at this time, so make sure you check us out tomorrow as well. Okay, so yesterday uh, we did a speaking part one and part two. Uh, that went well. I'm sure many of you in today's class uh, were here yesterday as well. And you remember that one of the important strategies I showed you for the listening section of the IELTS is to review the topics of part one, two, three, four in the introduction time. So yesterday, we learned that part three has something to do with trade and taxes maybe, okay? Um, and uh, part four has to do with Michelangelo, the artist. So we're going to start listening part three in just a moment. I'm going to play the audio through my headset uh, and a nice speaker. So if it's quiet for you, turn up the volume, use a headset if you have one. Don't put the answers in the chat while we're listening. Put the answers on a separate piece of paper and a separate document. We will share the answers at the end. Um, you just don't want to share them while we're listening because it will confuse other viewers, okay? So keep that in mind. All right, so I'm going to hop over to our listening exam. Uh, this is listening exam. Um, number five, so this is our fifth exam, and again, this is part three. So, here we go, everyone. Let's start the audio, 
Uh, get your pens, pencils ready. I'm just going to hop over to our website here. I will log into my student account. Once I'm in my student account, I see all of my materials, my computer-based practice exams, full online courts, IELTS exams, lesson videos, and then I see my IELTS audio CDs. In my IELTS audio CDs, I'm going to jump to uh, CD5 because it's our fifth exam. And then I'm going to jump to track three because we're doing part three. So here we go, everyone. Listen, answer, and then we'll share answers at the end. Okay, here we go. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening, Section 3. You will hear a forum discussion between the moderator and two contributors, Dr. Rachel Young and Dr. Ronald Sturgeon, both political scientists at the local university, talking about trade between countries. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Young and Dr. Sturgeon for taking the time to spend this afternoon with us. Thank you for having us here today. Dr. Young, could you give us a little background on the topic of free trade and protectionism, a little history? Well, countries and nation states have been participating in free trade schemes for millennia. The ancient Egyptians, for example, participated in trade with the Arabians across the Red Sea over 3,000 years ago. The Roman Empire imported many goods from outside their lands, especially luxury goods such as silk, which were only available in China. Free trade, however, though, has much younger roots. Could you define free trade and protectionism for us, Dr. Sturgeon? Free trade is trade between countries without taxes, tariffs, or other regulations attached. Without a free trade agreement, nations charge taxes or tariffs on goods that are imported to their country. This is to protect the manufacturers within their country. If country A, for example, produces a product for a 20% higher cost than country B, country A is likely to impose a tariff on the importation of country B's cheaper product into country A. This is to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. Free trade advocates want to take down this barrier. In my opinion, advocates of free trade do not care about domestic manufacturers and workers in their own country. I believe their only intention is to maximize profit for big international businesses. I know Dr. Sturgeon is impassioned about protectionism, but what he fails to mention is that while free trade may lead to some lost jobs in certain sectors, it leads to many other jobs in other sectors. This may be cold comfort to those in, say, manufacturing or textiles, but we must not be blind to the needs of the many and be distracted by the needs of the few. Nobody says free trade between countries is perfect, but it is certainly better than a protectionist framework which costs the country jobs and prosperity. Another point I would like to make is that free trade increases competition and thus lowers the price of many goods. This saves consumers money. Purchasing a car, for example, is much cheaper under free trade agreements. While such agreements may appear undesirable for a British company such as Land Rover, since they are given price disadvantage within the United Kingdom, this is not the whole story. While it is true that the company is at a minor disadvantage within their home country, free trade agreements puts them in an equally advantageous position in other countries in which the UK has a free trade agreement. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. This is a very interesting discussion. Dr. Sturgeon, from reading some of your work, I know you have some ethical concerns about free trade. Yes, I have a number of ethical concerns. First and foremost, free trade agreements incentivize highly unethical sweatshops. When countries such as the United Kingdom enter free trade agreements with countries with lower human rights standards, we put ourselves at risk of tacitly endorsing those low human rights standards. Is the ability to wear slightly cheaper clothing really worth selling out on one of our most basic beliefs, that people should be treated with respect? I agree with Dr Sturgeon that human rights is an ongoing issue in free trade. Certain incidents, such as sweatshops collapsing and killing dozens of workers, have highlighted this issue in the media and public discourse. But these are isolated incidents. Hardly. These are not isolated at all. And even if such horrible incidents were rare, does it make the conditions those workers work in permissible? Do we excuse horrible working conditions as long as the workers don't die? That's an incredibly low bar, and one I believe we must implore companies and governments to raise. OK, OK, let's move on. Dr Young, do you believe free trade betters the life of the average British citizen? Absolutely. I believe free trade agreements make us more prosperous as a society. While not perfect, I truly believe pursuing free trade agreements is a positive step in making our world a better place. Of course I disagree. While I do not doubt that more wealth comes into our country as a result of free trade agreements, I believe this money never improves the life of the average citizen. The rich get richer and the middle class workers get laid off. Not to mention the ethical issues I have with this. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, students, and always use that half minute to check your answers. I'm just going back to our website here at aehelp.com to stop the audio. And now we'll hop back uh, to the uh, listening section questions, and we'll go through these. So here you have a conversation between a couple of professors uh, talking about free trade versus protectionism. So you definitely have to understand a couple of key points in uh, the listening parts here. It's free trade where there are no taxes uh, between countries when they're trading um, versus protectionism where there are taxes between countries that are trading. So let's go through these answers. This first one, pay really careful attention to the instructions, it's no more than one word for each answer. The question here is how long ago was the first record of trade uh, between nations, okay? And all you needed here uh, was a number, okay? So it's no more than one word. A number will also suffice as a word. So if you can use a number, I highly, highly recommend using a number, okay? Uh, Irfan and Jack William and Jyoti say ah, that should be 3,000. Yeah, so it was 3,000, okay? And now um, a little bit more here. So active listening. When you're listening actively, you're able to give more detail and go above and beyond. So when they're talking about this, uh, trade 3,000 years ago, uh, which groups of people were trading according to the speaker? So who caught that? It's a little bit of a bonus bonus round, um, bonus point. So uh, who or which groups were trading according to history 3,000 years ago? Does anybody remember that? Let's see who was visualizing um, while listening. So Balbir says it was the Egyptians and who? Yes, so half of it's right, Balbir and Hamsar uh, Vadan. The Egyptian people were trading with who? So Egyptians with uh, the Chinese. I don't know, Huang Yuan, was it the Chinese? 
Maybe. Okay. Well, let's check. All right. So if you're not sure, um, one really good way to uh, improve your active listening is to check the transcript. So here, the transcripts are on page 134. The transcripts means that it's the written um, dialogue here. So, all right. Let's go to... Section three here. All right. Here we go. So the ancient Egyptians, for example, um, participated um, in free trade with the Arabians. So it's not the Chinese. It's the Arabians. That's right. Very good. And uh, Chenta got that. So Chenta says it was with the Arabians, not the Chinese. Okay, so Egyptians with the Arabians. So again, here's an important tip, everybody. If you're not sure of the answers, check the transcripts. Okay, so practice. This is for your practice. Okay, practice what's called active listening before your IELTS, okay? This means go above and beyond the questions in the exam. And especially when you're in groups, uh, you can ask each other extra questions. So ask extra questions. Okay, if you're not sure of the answers, A, listen again, and B, check the transcripts. All right, so that's a very good strategy uh, to uh, improve your active listening skills. All right, let's hop back to the questions uh, now. And then look at some more. Okay, here we go. So here we had a bit of a flow chart. Okay. And uh, when you have a flow chart type question, one really important strategy is to pay attention to some standard uh, number information or name information like 20% or country B that helps you to identify the location in the audio. Is that clear everyone? So you want to be clear on the location of the audio and a good way to do that is by paying attention to names and numbers in the information that's given. Okay, so this is a strategy. All right, and especially useful for flowchart type questions. So um, use names and numbers to identify your location in the audio, especially for uh, flowchart type questions. Okay, so here you were listening for this 20% uh, higher cost than country B. And then um, here we go, a company in country A imports the product. If the country does not have a free trade agreement, the company must pay uh, something to import the product. So um, what do they pay? Okay. Uh, VG says it's tariffs. Yeah, very good. And it's a common noun, so you can use all lowercase, okay? Taxes is okay, but the better word is tariffs, okay? Now, here, this would be marked wrong. Why? So if I write tariffs to import the product, it will be marked wrong. Why? Can anybody tell me? 
So why is AK Huang Yuan Tai says no S? Why no S? So Huang, you have the correct answer. But why is there no S? Harwinder Shran says because of ah, yeah. So here I have the article a, ah, which means that this is singular. So I have to take out the S and then it becomes correct, okay? Pay really careful attention. Um, and when you're reviewing your answers, if you catch that, um, make sure to correct it so you save yourself a mark, okay? So if there's a, ah, then it has to be singular, okay? So be very careful about that. All right, um, this is to level the playing field for, okay, and then something. Now, when you have um, this uh, here, let me get this a little bit more centered. There we go. Okay, um, so when you have this quotation mark, you know that they will say this exact phrase in the audio. So this is a direct quote. It means you will hear this exact wording. Otherwise, it's paraphrased. So you're not likely to hear exactly the same words, especially in part three and part four, except for when you see the quotation marks. Then you'll hear the exact same words, okay? For domestic manufacturers, okay? Now here you have the S because they say it. There's no article. So in this case, it is a plural. So domestic manufacturers, all right? Okay, um, that means local producers. So people who make products locally, all right? Domestic manufacturers. Good job, Jack. Good job, Shinju. Um, Evan Hard, very nicely done. Andre, good answer. Uh, Aryan, Jane, very nicely done. Okay, correct answer, good. Okay, so moving along, and with flowcharts, you really have to keep pace. You have to move along with the audio. So if the countries do have a free trade agreement, the company does not have to pay to import the item. Some advocates of protectionism believe free trade advocates are only worried about maximizing something for large companies. Ariane says that would be profits, right? And logic here will help you to guess this if you didn't get it. So profits, or in this case, profit is okay too. So here, maximizing profit or maximizing profits both are okay, but usually it's one or the other. So usually it's singular or plural, okay? So profit, profits, both are uh, correct grammatically in this uh, context, so they will take both, okay? In the answer key for the IELTS, it'll look like this. Okay, so profits. In rare cases, um, they'll have both the singular and the plural as correct answers. All right, so we're moving along nicely now. Here, by this time, you should have realized that, okay, this conversation is clearly about free trade uh, versus protectionism. which is the opposite of free trade. Okay, now when you're doing the listening section and you hear certain topics like free trade, protectionism, and you realize that's the topic of discussion, you th should think about real examples in the real world to help you understand this. Um, which countries have free trade? So what are examples of free trade in the world? Let's see if anybody actually thought about this while you're listening. So you're like, oh yeah, there's free trade in these countries, or this is a free trade agreement. Um, I know the free trade agreement that we have here in Canada. Um, does anybody know the free trade that Canada, US, and Mexico has? Okay, Paulo Reese, very good. So free trade, the EU, yeah, the European Union is a type of free trade or free trade agreement among the uh, European countries. Uh, Paulo says NAFTA, yeah. So NAFTA 
is the North American Free Trade Agreement between Mexico, United States, and Canada. That's right. Um, Paul Reese says Mercosul. Yeah, that's another free trade agreement. Um, there's free trade agreement in Asia. There's the Asian free trade agreement as well. So uh, there's definitely certain free trade agreements in the world. Okay, who does not have free trade? So which countries uh, don't have free trade? There's definitely one that's a big source of conflict and argument. But she says SAFTA. Uh, Jack Williams says the Aegean. Yeah, absolutely. So those are the free, the G7. Eh, I don't know about that, Balbir. Okay. Um, North Korea, Jack, is not does not have free trade with any country as far as I know. Yeah, very good, Balbir. So China versus U.S. Yeah. So uh, between the U.S. and China, there's definitely protectionism in a big, big way. So anytime U.S. moves products to China, which is less, um, or China moves products to the U.S., which is a lot, um, there are all kinds of taxes and tariffs. Um, there's protectionism there. So you should be visualizing this kind of uh, situation when you're thinking about this listening, okay, that will greatly help you. So connecting the discussion to your real world knowledge can really help you to figure out correct answers. Is everybody clear on that? Okay, uh, Shivam, US, India, absolutely. Protectionism there, almost as intense as with China. Yeah, absolutely, okay, so this is another important strategy, okay? So strategy uh, two here, all right? Um, make sure to connect the topic of discussion in the listening section to your real world knowledge. Okay, as this will help you get a better score. Okay, so the example here, uh, free trade equals NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement versus protectionism uh, equals US and uh, China, okay? So everybody good there, yeah, all right. Uh, space uh, ob jobs, yeah, you are allowed to take notes in the listening uh, for the computer-based exam. You do have a piece of paper and a pen. So yes, you can, and there are a couple questions where that's valuable or question types, okay? All right, um, let's hop back and let's keep answering some questions here. So here we go. Um, okay, 25 was a two-word answer. Some people will lose their jobs under free trade agreements, but we must emphasize the needs of the something and not be sidetracked by the needs of the. You have to have the correct order answering this question. So some people will lose their jobs under free trade agreements, but we must emphasize the needs of the... What? Uh, VG says money and field. No, that's not right. I think VG, you might have some autocorrect going on there. Uh, Shinju says many and few. Huang Yuen Tai agrees. Yeah, it's many and few, and you have to have the correct order. So many, few. If you put uh, few and many into your answer sheet, you'll get it wrong. So make sure you have the correct order here. 26, uh, free trade lowers the price of many goods because it increases what? Okay, so no more than three words here. This is many, few, you only need the two words. You don't need and. Nimrat, you just keep many and few, okay? Now, 26, free trade lowers the price of many goods because it increases, and this makes sense, okay? Le Payen says the same as Bakrat and Jazz competition. 
Yeah. Make sure you can spell these kinds of words in English because it's so terrible when an IELTS candidate has the right answer but the wrong spelling, okay? So competition, okay, good. Uh, now, we had a little table here that we needed to fill in or fill out, okay? Number 27, 28. Uh, complete the chart below, write no more than one word for each answer. Look at the headings. This is the cause. This is the effect. The cause, they enter into a free trade agreement. Jeopardize human rights standards, right, to increase that competition. Okay. The cause, sweatshops collapse. So these factories where lots of people are working in terrible conditions collapse. The conditions are highlighted in the something. It's one word here, Shinju. Very good. Evan, be confident in your answer. Media is correct. The conditions are highlighted in the media. Very good. Um, cause, the realization that such incidents are not isolated implore companies and something to raise the bar. Um, so number 28, companies is a noun. I recognize that it's a plural noun with an S. So this should also be some kind of a noun with and, and it should also have an S. Rashika, Aryan, Shinju, pay attention to the plural form of the previous noun. So government sa, okay? So implore companies and governments to raise the bar because we need to have parallel grammar form, okay? Uh, nouns are always paralleled in a, a list, okay? For plurals and singulars. So be really careful about that. If the first is a plural, the second is going to be a plural. If the first is a singular, the second is going to be a singular. Okay? All right. Okay, so multiple choice. Here you really have to listen for the answer. You do not have enough time to clearly read all of the choices, even if you're a native speaker. So you're not focusing here. You're focusing here. Okay, that's where your eyeball is, is on the question. Okay. All right. Uh, what is Dr. Young? You're concentrating on Dr. Young's main point. So Dr. Young will say something like, I believe. Okay, the main idea here. And then you're listening for advocating for free trade, so supporting free trade. Is it A, that free trade agreements are the single biggest economic driver for making the world a better place? Is it B, that um, free trade agreements are not perfect, but they're a good step towards increasing global welfare? C, free trade agreements are not always positive, but can be important to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. This one, by listening carefully, we know cannot be. So it's a 50-50. It's either A or B. The correct answer for that one is B. Okay. So um, he says free trade agreements are not, you know, they're not perfect, right? He agrees. They're not, you know, but they're a good step towards increasing global welfare. So they are the right way to have prosperity around the world. Okay. And it's the same idea for uh, number 30. Now, if I didn't get this one again, what do I do? I go back and I check the transcript, right? Okay. Number 30, what is Dr. Sturgeon's? main point in advocating for protectionism. Okay. Overall wealth is increasing in society. Middle class jobs are the foundation of a, an economy that works for the few and not just for domestic manufacturers. They don't talk about that, right? We didn't really hear uh, too much about middle class jobs. 
Okay, free trade agreements are bad because they concentrate wealth in the hands of an elite few. Correct answer here, C. So he says, we got to have protectionism because free trade is just concentrating money. It's not balancing money in society. Okay, so B and C, and I can see that Girnath, uh, Bakrat, Potato, uh, Balbir, Andri, Irfan, all got it correct. So good job, everyone. Big thumbs up. Wow. Very nice. The rich get richer. Very good. Evan um, Hard says, yeah, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, right? Very nice. Uh, Potato, you absolutely do not have transcripts in the exam. You only have the audio. You listen just once. Okay. So very good. All right. No transcripts in the exams, only for good study materials. All right, let's get right into part four, the lecture. Here we go, everyone. So we're going to hop back to the website. Again, I'm playing the audio through my headset. Um, adjust your volume accordingly and save your answers until the end. Don't put them in the chat, so don't confuse other students, especially if you're giving wrong answers. That's super confusing. So save it till the end. Here we go. Uh, let's hop back to the website, start up the audio, everybody get ready, and go. Battery, 50%. Time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a university lecture on the famous artist Michelangelo. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good to see you all. As you know, we're having an exam a week from today. Material from today's class will be included on the exam, but material from the final two classes of the week will not be included. I hope this will give you an opportunity to revise enough to perform well on the exam. With that administrative business out of the way, I'd like to begin today's lecture on the lesser known works and endeavors of the famous Italian Renaissance artist Michelangelo. While Michelangelo is best known for his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he was also the creator of a number of other highly respected works. Among these are the Pieta, a statue of Mary holding a deceased Jesus, and the statue David, said to be the representative of the perfect male form. But Michelangelo was not just a painter and a sculptor. One of his crowning achievements is St. Peter's Basilica, a project he was lead architect on for the 17 years preceding his death in 1564. While the basilica wasn't completed until 1626, over 60 years after his death, Michelangelo's influence on the structure was immense as he had laid out many plans for the structure during his lifetime, many of which were faithfully carried out under the reign of future popes and future architects. Michelangelo's fingerprints are all over modern Rome, and especially what is today Vatican City. Not only through his paintings, frescoes, and sculptures, but also through his architectural achievements. In addition to his influence on St. Peter's Basilica, Michelangelo also redesigned the famous Capitolini Hill area of Rome, and designed many chapels within the walls of the Vatican. Michelangelo was also tasked with a number of pet projects over the years. These projects were not one that the man himself wanted to undertake, but was compelled to because of monetary considerations or simply loyalty to the Pope. For example, when Pope Julius II ordered him to construct a three times life-size bronze statue of the Pope, Michelangelo had no choice but to accept. The project took up more than two years of his life, and four years after its completion, the work was unceremoniously melted down to construct cannons. Additionally, the conditions under which he was made to work were often sorely substandard. For years, he lived and worked with four other men in a cramped apartment with little to no privacy and no room for his creative juices to flourish. 
It is interesting to imagine what a genius such as Michelangelo could have accomplished given reign over his own creativity. I personally believe the world is a poor place for him having not been allowed this luxury. However, on the other hand, perhaps Michelangelo's sometimes tortured life imbued his works of art with something more than just artistic genius. Although Michelangelo is a celebrated figure for his works of art and well respected for his architectural acumen, his literary works are virtually unknown to the world. He was a virtuoso of Renaissance art, celebrated in his lifetime and venerated centuries after his death, but his writings never made an impact on the society in which he lived, nor in the years since. Michelangelo was an avid writer of poetry and found that poetry was an invaluable escape from the grind of his everyday work life, especially during the years spent arduously painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Poetry provided an outlet for his frustrations, fears, beliefs, and desires. Those who want to know the real Michelangelo must go beyond his frescoes and sculptures and dig deep into his personal writings. There, one will find a rather tortured soul, harmed by years of physical, political, professional, and personal strife. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. And again, students, check those answers in that half minute. Okay, so here we go. Um, this is a very, very typical part four type of question setup where you basically have a, a parallel summary of the lecture, which is paraphrased. So it's using a little bit different words, different grammar than the actual lecture. And you have to fill in the blanks. Okay, so we had a couple of simple short answer questions to start you off. And then we got right into it. So here we go. Write the correct letter A or B next to the question on the exam, not on the exam. Note, by the way, you may use any letter more than once. Number 31, material from the third week of class. It's on the exam or not on the exam. You had to understand what the professor was saying and then you figured out, okay, that's going to be on the exam or not on the exam. Um, yeah, that's not on the exam. So the professor here says, um, the, uh, the material from the following week and the week after will not be on the exam. Okay. So the third week, uh, number 32 material from the current class. So this material about Michelangelo, it's on the exam or not on the exam. Number 32, uh, Deepak Chantal says that's going to be on the exam. Lots of other people agree. Absolutely. So B and A were the correct answers here. So the inverse of this here. Okay, so B and A. Very good. All right, those are kind of the easier. They're kind of just letting you ease into this faster part four, no breaks. And then Michelangelo. Now, of course, if you know about Michelangelo, that's going to be useful. I always recommend students to read on a variety of topics. Michelangelo, very famous Italian uh, painter, sculptor, um, famous figure in history, appears in many movies, books, writings, so on. Okay, pay attention to these topics. So other works, Michelangelo. While Michelangelo is perhaps most famous for painting the Sistine Chapel, he is also famous for a number of other highly respected works, including the Pieta and the statue named something thought to symbolize male beauty, so it's a man, okay, um, David, yeah, so David, very good, um, and uh, it's funny, somebody's saying, I've never heard about him, um, if you've ever watched the movie Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they're named after uh, famous painters in, uh, from the Renaissance, so Raphael, Michelangelo, Donatello, Leonardo, that Ninja Turtle that has the name Michelangelo is named after this Michelangelo. Even if you haven't directly heard of Michelangelo, I'm sure you've heard indirectly of Michelangelo. Okay, um, so thought to symbolize male beauty, okay? David, all right. Architectural achievements, far more than just the painter. Michelangelo was also an architect. He was lead architect on St. Peter's 
basilica for something until his death in 1564. <clears throat> Shavam says 17 years. Shavam, very good. 17 years. Yeah. Um, though the structure was not completed until 60 years after his death, his fingerprints are all over the resulting structure because future something and something faithfully carried out his designs. Okay? Yeah, Bavya, yeah, two words only. So you can use a number and a word, but only two. Okay? Paul O'Ree says, Popes and architects. Yeah, and Popes is actually capitalized. So, Popes and architects. If you're not sure about the capitalization of Popes, uh, look for the word in other parts of the summary. You'll find it, and you'll see it's capitalized. Okay? That's how you know. Uh, Rashika, it's not Pops. That's a different word. You definitely need the E. So, Popes. Um, use the given material to help you with the answer. So if you're not 100% sure on the spelling of popes, um, then just take a look at it in other parts of the summary and you can figure it out. Okay. So there it is. All right. So use the given information. Okay. Okay. Uh, Michelangelo's influence is also apparent around the rest of the city of what city, including at the ancient Capolini site. This was a little bit tricky. Bavia, it wasn't the Vatican. Okay, Vatican is inside of this city. Yeah, Jack, very good. It's the city of Rome in Italy. So city of Rome, uh, not just the Vatican. So, um, and you can figure this out with apparent around the rest of the city. So Vatican is inside of Rome. Uh, Rome is the bigger city. There are uh, statues created by Michelangelo all over Rome, not just in the Vatican. Okay. So use your logic. Okay. And the professor says that very clearly. She explains that you can see Michelangelo's influence all over Rome. Okay. But yeah, Vatican is a city. It's also a state. Um, it's the holy capital of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's within the city of Rome. So it's like a city within a city, and it's autonomous. It has its own government and uh, its own uh, police and everything. Okay, so it's a very unique situation. All right, um, servant of the papacy. Uh, he was also a loyal servant of the Pope. Sometimes this was important work, though sometimes it was rather pointless. Um, he once built a something of the Pope, only to see it melted down for cannon parts just a few years later. That's right, um, Evan Hard. That's right, Balbir. It was a bronze statue. A three times life-size bronze statue of the Pope, only to see it melted down for cannon parts just a few years later. Moreover, the something he had to work in were often substandard, often being forced to live and work in small, cramped spaces with a number of other men. So he was kind of pushed together and having to work away. Yeah. Um, the conditions, it's a plural, okay? Uh, Paulo, close with circumstances, conditions. So the conditions, not just a condition, it's countable. The conditions. Circumstances, IELTS will probably give you the point for that, Paulo. So if you put circumstances, in this case, that's a perfect synonym. And if you have a perfect synonym, IELTS will give you the point. But it's tricky to find the perfect synonym, so you should have the same word that they use in the audio. Paulo, in this case, I'm 99% sure that they would give you the mark for circumstances. Okay. All right, uh, literary works. It is interesting to think what he could have made if he was given the freedom to explore his own something. And it's the end of the sentence here. Notice this is a capital. 
to explore his own. So it's the object of the sentence. Very good, students. It's to explore his creativity. Okay. While his life may have been difficult, some people argue that this difficulty made him a better artist. Mm hmm. Okay. Something was an important way to escape the difficulties of Michelangelo's life. So this was kind of interesting. She talks a lot about this. It's the start of a sentence, so you should capitalize this. Okay. Um, and uh, what else did uh, Michelangelo do other than sculpt and paint? He also wrote poetry. That's right. So poetry was an important way to escape the difficulties of Michelangelo's life. Though his writings never made much of an artistic impact, they do offer a window into his tortured genius. Um, Bavia, yeah, you can write all capital letters on the IELTS exam. So you can write all capital letters, but it's a bit slower to write all capital letters, and it's easier to make uh, mistakes. Don't mix it. If you're going to write all capital letters, make sure all of your answers are in capital letters. One good trick is to write all lowercase letters in your question booklet. And then when you transfer your answers to the answer sheet, uh, change them to all capitals. But make sure that the spelling stays the same. Don't lose the spelling. Um, check that. Now, that's for the paper-based exam only. In the computer-based exam, you can just hit caps lock and type all capital letters. Okay, so above you, you can actually use the caps lock button uh, to write all capital letters. Okay, if you want to do that, that's fine. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Koi Nguyen, you can find the transcript of this uh, in the back of the book. Uh, for this one, it's on page uh, 134. So if you have um, our full course at ahelp.com, or gltelp.com, you'll find it on page 134. So uh, here, see, we're on page 49. If I switch to page 134, this will probably be closer to like 137, something like that. Um, then uh, it'll be back there, okay? Yeah, maybe a little bit later, one. 50 or one sorry uh, 141 140 yeah there it is okay so there's michelangelo all right so um cd5 track 4 page 141 all right okay everyone so how did you do uh for those of you who were here yesterday and today and i can see Jyoti was here yesterday and today how did you do what did you get out of 40 uh you can check your band score on our website. So if you go to the website uh, and you go to the bottom of the website, there's an IELTS score calculator. Let me darken the screen for you a bit so uh, you can see this clearly. Okay, so here's your IELTS score calculator. We'll click on that. Okay. And then Jyoti says 35, um, 35 is a band eight. All right. Um, let's see, Bakrat got 21. Correct, Bakrat 21 is a band 5.5. Okay, uh, Irfan 31, 31 is a band seven. Um, Evan Hard 33. 33 is a band, 7.5, okay? Uh, Pooja, 27. Um, let's see, 27. 27 is a band, 6.5, okay? So you can use that score calculator on the website. Students, that's it for today. Great job today and yesterday on this listening section. Um, if you want to get five more practice exams, over 100 hours of video lessons, fully interactive course, apps for your phone to help you prepare and maximize the value and investment of your time and energy into the official IELTS exam, I highly recommend checking out aehelp.com for academic IELTS, gieltshelp.com for general IELTS. Uh, general IELTS page uh, looks like this, green background. Click that big red button, 
join the premium package. It's worth your effort, in my opinion. And good luck. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, we have speaking part two cue card live class, and we'll have a question and answer session uh, for our members. So make sure to join us at this time uh, tomorrow and a bit earlier. That's it for today. Eugen, thank you for those emojis, putting a smile on people's faces at the end of the class, especially with the Mr. Potato Head emoji. I love that one. Um, okay, everybody, have a fantastic start to the weekend. See you tomorrow. Much love to all of you wherever you are. I'm Adrian signing out from Victoria for now. Bye.